tonight, exclusive interviews with the murder suspects in the Stephen Lawrence case. For the first time, their conflicting evidence on the night. It doesn't look too good on the face of it, that's it right. No, it doesn't. For the first time, their fascination with knives and violence. I never used a cosh. I had the cosh in my hand. And for the first time, their extreme racism. Am I what you'd call a packing? Well, some people would call you a packing of violence. Making news, making headlines. Tonight, with Trevor MacDonald. Good evening and welcome to the first program in our new series. And we begin with a special edition devoted entirely to the first interviews with the murder suspects in the Stephen Lawrence case. Since that fatal stabbing in April 1993, those five suspects have maintained an almost total silence. Three gave no information to the police. All five refused to answer any questions at Stephen's inquest. And at the public inquiry, questions about their guilt or innocence couldn't be put for legal reasons. In agreeing to speak to us, they clearly had their own reasons. Perhaps they were attempting to change public perceptions and to counter these images of a swaggering gang, arrogant and defiant. But this program also had a set of aims. We wanted to submit them to the interrogation they've never had and to shed more light than what really happened on the night Stephen was killed. Our reporter Martin Bashir questioned the five under strictly controlled conditions. Unlike the public inquiry, no areas were off limits. The suspects were interviewed separately. They were prevented from speaking to each other in between. They asked for no money and none was offered. Stephen Lawrence's murder led to one of the largest public inquiries ever held in Britain. Its findings have led to grave questions about racism in the ranks of the police and in society as a whole. And indeed, it may yet lead to changes in the law. But no one has heard from the five men at the top of the police wanted list until tonight. The prime suspects. Jamie Acourt. Luke Knight. Gary Dobson. David Norris. Neil Acourt. We're seen in the public eye as murderers, big time gangsters, just killers. We, we, we're looked upon as scum. Their behaviour as they left the public inquiry last year outraged the nation. The fact of the matter is, you are photographed blowing kisses. On another occasion, you're photographed spitting. On another occasion, you're photographed punching people. That is not the conduct of an innocent man coming out of a public inquiry into the tragic death of a young black teenager. Yeah, f f fair enough, right? That is disgraceful but, behaviour. But you've got, you've got. No, I don't no, know how many. Do you accept that was disgraceful behaviour? No, I don't. That was in self defence. The fight, the throwing punches, bit. Blowing kisses were not self-defence. No, I, I, I admit Spitting that, is not self-defence. No, that's wrong, right? But so if you, someone you spits accept, in your face, you a big green phlegm in your face, what are you going to do? Do you accept that that behaviour was disgusting? Yeah, I do. That was a mob of absolute lunatics trying to get to us to kill us, and nothing less. The answer less. was for you to rush into the van. And, and it, it was not happening. to spit back at people and throw punches which completely undermined your belief that you're innocent. That's, that's, that is my natural person coming out of me. I'm a, I'm a defender of myself. You're a natural fighter? No, not a natural fighter. You said a it's a nat your natural a, person a, a coming na out. A natural defender. You're no, a natural defender? Defender so of myself. So you throw punches naturally when someone comes towards you? Oh, yes, without a doubt. If someone, someone spits at you, you spit back? Yes. If someone punches you, you punch back? Yeah, I'll fight fire with fire. Eltham, South East London, an area with a history of racial violence. This is the setting where five youths earned their reputation as a gang of local troublemakers. Gary Dobson admits that even from a young age, he and his friends were causing trouble. We was five young lads on, on an estate. I mean, Did you have a reputation, a bit of a reputation maybe? Um, no, it was... Um, 
not as fighters or violent people as such. I mean, but we, you've got to understand that every council state across the length of Britain has got the little bastards who, who, who break windows, who, I don't know, who um, play knockdown ginger. And were you part of a group of, as you put it, little bastards on the estate who played we knockdown we've, we've ginger? We've never pretended to be angels. We've never pretended to be anyone else but ourselves. So were, were you a group of little bastards on the estate? Yeah, rascals, lo lovable rogues. Luke Knight was the youngest of the gang. I mean, I had fights in school. I've never said that I was an angel, but I've never used knives and I've never stabbed anyone or I've never killed anyone. The reputation of David Norris's family had gone before him. His father currently in prison for firearms and drug offences, his uncle recently released after a long jail term for importing drugs. He lived in relative luxury, a mansion in Chislehurst, three miles away. His troublemaking career began at school. To be honest, you know, I don't think I was really made for school. What do you mean? Well, like, the teachers and all that used to, well, in my opinion, they, some of them used to pick on me, and, like, I probably exaggerated it sometimes with some of them, but some of them did used to pick on me and, like, stuff. And, um... You seem to pick on people, too. I mean, in, in one school report, it says December 90, 1989, you were expelled, mm -hmm. and it said it, you were expelled because of uncontrollable, violent behaviour. What happened? Yeah, I'd like to know what happened myself. I don't know you what happened. You don't happened. remember? No, no. I got... I had, um, behavioural problems, but as violent... as, as, as like, as far as violent behaviour, that's not... Where did like. the behavioural problems come from, do you I think? I don't know, Martin. I was just... Given that you had a lot of material possessions, mm -hmm. you say you had a very happy family, yes. both parents together, where did this violent, uncontrollable behaviour come from? The, the uncontrollable behaviour, I don't know about the violent, because I've, I've never been violent, Martin. I've had a bit of a short temper, but as far as violent, like, that's not happening, because I never used to have a fight in school. I had, a, I had one fight in school, and that was in the second year, I think. But as you're growing up, the boys have fights, and they get in trouble, and they say things they shouldn't do, and they do things they shouldn't do. Brothers Neil and Jamie Acourt were the most feared. They had a well-established reputation for violence and were said to be known locally as the Craze. You're saying that you had a reputation that was based on school days. No, no, no not school days. Any days, any time from when I grew up to the age of 17, 18 when I was arrested. Right. If someone put trouble my way, I, I would not stand for it. Simple as that. So, would you ever use weapons? If someone attacked me with a weapon, and there was a weapon, then I'd pick it up, simple as that, I'd defend my life. As they got older, their violence was often targeted at black people. Jamie Acourt was suspended from Kidbrook School after he was found with a monkey wrench in his bag. The following day, he had a fight outside the school gates with a black pupil called Sean Kalitzi. Acourt was armed with a kosh. I'd fight of him. Just me and him, we had a fight. Why did you have a fight with him? It was just, I can't remember, I can't remember why it was. It was just over saying silly. I was it over the fact that he was black? No, it wasn't, no. And he, I, I guarantee he can say it weren't, because it weren't. A number of people at the school, including himself, were aware that you were both liable to use weapons and regularly used racist language at school. You deny that? Yeah, I do. Even though you admit that you took a monkey wrench, and even though you admit you used a kosh for the fight... I never used the kosh. If there's anyone saying that I did use it, they're lying, because I never. No one's seen me use the kosh, because I never used the kosh. I had the kosh in my hand. And there's no one yet come forward to say that I have, because I haven't. What and about the incident on the estate when you threatened a woman with a lump of wood and were cautioned by the police? I'd, li I'd like to see the caution records by the police. I'd like someone to produce them, because that's never happened. The police maintain that they have those well, I'd records. Like to, I'd like them to come forward and produce but did you, did records. You, did you threaten a woman with no, a lump never. of wood? No, I'd you, like to see, I'd like to see the caution so records. So, you didn't threaten a woman with a lump of wood, you didn't attack Sean Kalitzi with a kosh, you didn't own the monkey wrench, I mean, come on. There are, those are three separate incidents of your period as a schoolboy. And these are all things that have been twisted to make me look like the bad guy. When 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence was killed at this bus stop on April the 22nd, 1993, the question people asked was, could this gang of youths be responsible? The killers ran away down Dixon Road and onto the Brook Estate, where four of the five suspects lived. 
Gary Dobson in Phineas Pett Road, Luke Knight on Wellhall Road, Jamie and Neil Acourt in Bournebrook Road, and David Norris lived three miles away in Chislehurst. The Acourts say they were at home together, so you'd expect their stories to match, but they don't. Were you at home? Yeah. So you were at home for the whole night? Mm. Did you go out at all? No, not what I'm aware of, no. Not that you're aware of. No. So you say that you were at home and you didn't go out at all. Were you aware that something serious had happened in the area? Because your house is pretty nearby. Yeah. Were you aware that something had happened? Not what I can remember, no. You can't remember? No. So, when did you first hear that there had been a murder? I think it might have been the next day, on the nose, I think. When did you first hear that a stabbing, a murder had taken place? I didn't hear there was a murder until, I think, the next day. But I heard there was a stabbing, I think it was late that night. Who told you? Um, someone knocked on the door who was passing through the area and said to us that there'd been a killing or a... S no, not a killing. He said there'd been a stabbing or someone had been attacked in the area. As you know, I've also interviewed your brother. And you said that your brother was in the house when this individual came and informed you that there had been an attack. As far as I can remember, yes. Yeah. He says the first he heard of the attack was the following day on television. Oh, Jamie. Mm. Well, that's down to him. If he can't remember that actual um, point, then that's, you'll have to ask him that. But, uh... I can't, I can't remember for him. But no, sure, sure, sure. But uh, there's a problem there, isn't there? Because you're saying quite clearly mm. that you, you said in this interview, you not only heard the news from this individual who yeah. knocked on the door, right. you also most likely would have discussed it with Gary, mentioned it with Gary. I might have said something to Gary, yes. Sure. But your brother says that he heard mm. that this attack had taken place the following day. He didn't hear anything about it on the evening. So is he not telling the truth? I'm not saying he's lying for one moment. Or I'm saying that if he can't... Well, you can't both be right, can if you? If he can't remember anything, then, then that's down to him. So, two brothers, two different stories. And now a third. It comes from their friend, Gary Dobson, who says he went round to their house late that night when someone came to the door. But he has a different version of what happened next. He knocked at the door, spoke to us, asked us if we knew anything about it, and then more or less left. Knew anything about what? The murder. So, so he talked to you about the murder? Yeah. He said there's been a uh, boy killed down at Wellow. What time was that? Did he talk I don't know. That? I don't know. Around midnight? Possibly, yeah. And he actually said that someone had been killed? Yeah. So, despite them being together in the same house, Jamie Acourt says he didn't hear about the incident until the following day. Neil Acourt says he heard there'd been a stabbing on the night. Gary Dobson says they knew there'd been a murder. We've got three different stories here as to what happened. What was going on that night? Why can't you all agree with what was happening? Because maybe we ain't too 100% sure. It's not, a, like I say, it was to us, it was... It was a normal weekday night. It was. Your stories don't tally. Well, we don't remember every night what you do exactly, what you do. But what that was the most important said. night of your life. Now I know and that. I'm suggesting to you that when you say you heard from this individual who knocked on the door, mm. and your brother says he heard the following day, mm. that is a completely different set of stories. One of you's lying. No, one of us ain't lying. Obviously, one can't remember as well as the other. As simple as that. <laughs> well, that's one way of putting it. The other way is it's just one of you's lying. Well, I mean... One of you didn't want to admit that you were told when the person came to the front door because you wanted to keep the, the idea that actually you didn't know anything Any Anybody night. can have any view they want. I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. We're not trying to change a single person's mind. We don't want no one on our side. All we want is for people to hear, hear us fairly. And that's, that is all we want.